my first lesson on piano was when I was about four. So I don't really remember what it felt like, but all I can remember in that uh, of that time is the fact that I um, just liked that I was kind of good at something. Like it was really the fact that I can go to my grandma's house and play something on piano or we could be at Costco and there'd be like a little piano <laughs> set up and I could play and be good at it. But it was um, it wasn't until I started improvising that I started to feel like I wanted to do it and my parents didn't have to tell me to practice primarily because it became a way to express myself. Like I do remember a very clear moment of feeling really angry about something and not feeling like I could express that anger verbally anywhere and going to the piano and deciding I'm just gonna like play music from this angry headspace and 30 minutes later I was like oh I'm actually not that angry anymore and I think that uh, clarity of emotional processing uh, with playing the instrument is what made me feel like I fell in love with it and that probably happened when I was like eight or nine or something like that. Oh wow, that's yeah. so cool. At eight or nine to already be like that emotionally aware <laughs> is insane. It's such a cool <laughs> way. And where, like, where did your, if piano is almost like this therapeutic space for you, like where does your mind go when you are sitting there and, and improvising and, and composing? A lot of it is just, um, I don't even know how to explain it. I mean, I I sing a lot while I'm playing, like not in a way that I want anybody to hear. Like it's just like <laughs> I'm singing what I'm playing. But because of that, I'm very much just like there's this feedback loop where I play something and I might want to continue to build on that little riff and all that. Um, and also I might go in and out of registering how I feel emotionally, especially if I'm writing something. And I'm really aware of like, how is it supposed to make me feel? How is it supposed to make, if it's for a film or a TV show, how is it supposed to make the audience feel? And so there are times where I'll focus on a feeling and try to get into that headspace before I play. And then I'll start playing something and like, and try to check in with myself to see like, does this make me feel the way I want it to feel? And it might be like very clear that, no, that's not, that's not right. Let me try it again and try something else. But every now and then, whenever I feel like something resonates in a way where I feel really clear uh, emotions tied to what I was um, intending to feel with what I'm playing, that's when it feels like, oh, I might be really onto something. Oh, wow. So it's like it, once that thing clicks, it can just carry on moving forward. Yeah, like there's so many interesting moments where it's like I have to write this piece of music for something very sad and I'll be playing piano and then all of a sudden start to feel like, involuntary visceral feelings of sadness and then i'm like okay like then something i'm doing here is like helping me to like uh pull that emotion out of myself mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think i do need the visual for the catalyst because i think there's something like i can imagine a certain type of person but like seeing that person and like seeing um you know how they are choosing to dress or how they're being dressed for the show and and or for the film um, how it's shot, the lighting, like all that stuff creates a very clear and palpable mood that I do think is helpful for me to get started with. But once I have that, I usually, yeah, totally rely on the the emotional side of things. I feel like um, I'm not a particularly emotional person in my life or like at least like not outwardly emotional. <laughs> and And so it feels like music is kind of the only way that I really find um, myself becoming emotional or like any type of art but for me personally music um and so i think that always makes it a pretty clear uh uh test or litmus test to see if like something's working emotionally it's like if i'm making myself emotional then there's something that um is like out of my control that's like kind of going on mm -hmm. yeah. do you remember like a project maybe where it, you just it stirred up a lot of emotion so intensely that you were like oh wow this is gonna be this is going to be big and it's going to do especially well with an audience. Yeah, I think um, there are three that come to mind. Um, when They See Us, I think, with Ava, just because for that, I hadn't really thought about um, just my own parents' uh, fears around what my life could be as a like young black boy and young black man. And so seeing what happened to these boys and men um, really was like a visceral thing for me. And so writing music to that, I think, evoked that. Um, oddly enough, Bridgerton season one, I think, is just because of, uh, I don't know, I think like yeah, like the idea of a love story being about people 
choosing to work through the hardships of love and like the reality of like you know being with another person with all of their trauma and all of their background and all that kind of stuff and figure out how to work through that uh is something that i could definitely relate to just being um uh, married and, and working through that so i feel like that was one and and ava's new film origin that we just finished there's so many sequences in that that you know we're talking about slavery or the holocaust or you know um the Dalek community in India. And I feel like there's so many sequences in that movie that feel so emotional uh, or like losing, losing loved ones and um, writing music for that definitely felt uh, pretty visceral and emotional throughout the whole process. Yeah. So I was about 12. Um, I went to an arts high school here in LA called Loxa and I got in for music and I actually wanted to switch to visual arts because I wanted to be a cartoonist yeah. <laughs> and that freshman year, I just fell so deeply in love with um, with music and jazz and like my, I think being in an environment with other kids my age that were also that serious about music, that serious about jazz, I no longer felt like uh, an outcast in, in a school environment. And so that really feels like something that cemented this identity of being a musician. Um, and then around that same time, my parents, even though it was freshman year of high school, were like, like, well, what's your plan for, for college? Like, you know, what are you going to do? And at that point, I had already had this deep love for film music as well. And I, I already had a feeling that I wanted to find a way to get to that um, in my career, but try to find a way to that through jazz, since that's like what I was doing on a, on a daily basis. And so I told them when I was like 12, I want to go to school for jazz and like tour as a jazz artist and then transition into film scoring. Um, and that was always like very clearly like I never had a moment where I thought, oh, maybe I'll do something else. It was always like, oh, that's that's the path. And like, yeah, I try to figure out how to make it happen. And where did that love for jazz like first um, just start within you? I think it was, again, going back to that improvisation, like the fact that I was able to express myself based on where I was at in that moment. Um, also, the fact that um, it got my ear to be uh, a bit better because I was transcribing and learning things by ear. And so all of a sudden I could also learn songs from the radio and like play some song for, you know, kids at school or like play, uh, mostly play songs for girls in middle school. But, like, but I feel like, yeah, that, that ability to, to be able to like learn something, um, I feel like was a big part of it. Uh, and then also just the communal aspect of playing music together was always so fascinating to me that like we are playing together, listening to each other, like having a conversation um, and something new is happening every instant. I feel like that that process of playing with other people is always something that that like never gets old. I mean, the film music scene obviously is like you know LA is kind of the home for that, so that's definitely a pretty big part of it. On the jazz side, like I grew up uh, like a few minutes away from the world stage off of Grinshaw, and so I went there when I was a kid and like knew about the uh, like history of jazz in this city. Like my family owns a cleaners on central Avenue and central Avenue was like the jazz hub back in the day. And so I've always just been really aware of like, even though between LA and New York, I feel like yeah, LA is always, um, there are a lot of like negative stereotypes about jazz musicians in LA essentially, but I feel like I've always been aware of the strong history here. Um, and then I grew up in this crazy generation where it was like, me and Kamasi Washington and, um, you know, Steven and Ronald Bruner and like, uh, who's, you know, Thundercat. Uh, and like, um, I also knew about like Flying Lotus or this pianist, Alston Peralta, who passed away. But like, there's a lot of musicians, um, well, Terrace Martin's another one, like a lot of jazz musicians that also were doing a lot of work in hip hop, mm -hmm. but um, that were either like a couple of years, a couple of years older than me or around my age that also made me feel like really prideful about um being a part of that generation of, of jazz artists here mm -hmm. was it almost like you never you never felt like you were missing out on other jazz scenes because you were surrounded by that yeah exactly i think when i first moved to new york there was a part of me that was like oh i'm i'm like in the mecca of jazz essentially in a lot of ways and like really just because of the live music culture i think is just so different there um like i could go out at eight o'clock and come back at three in the morning and i've spent the whole time at a few different jazz clubs and like sitting in and jamming and all that stuff. So I feel like that type of energy doesn't really exist here. Um, but that being said, yeah, I never felt like um, uh, 
uh, I think a lot of the musicians that I surrounded myself with here in LA had a certain mentality and a certain like approach to playing that like by the time I got to New York, it all felt like pretty normal. And I felt like um, I didn't feel like I was out of my league or comfort zone. Mm -hmm. I think uh, one moment that definitely stands out, it's actually pretty early in my career, like even before a lot of film stuff, but um, I played at, at the White House um, like when Obama was president and um, I got to bring my dad. And I feel like that moment of like, you know, being a part of this big show there with all these other like legends. Uh, it was like, you know, Aretha Franklin and Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter and Sting, like all these people and being on that bill of musicians um, and to be able to invite my dad to that space to like see me be a part of a show like that, I think was one moment that definitely um, stands out for me as like feeling like uh, a little bit more confident or comfortable in this, this uh, feeling of like, uh, having a secure uh, position in, in an industry, I guess. And what was your dad's reaction when you took him to the White House? <laughs> the, the funniest thing is that it was like, you know, uh, a bunch of musicians and again, like a lot of very, very, very famous named musicians. And my dad was like, oh, like how many songs are you playing? I was like two. And he's like, oh, only two, huh? Like, <laughs> okay. like So like that was his first reaction. But uh, but he was he was super proud and happy about it. So, yeah. Yeah, I think the thing I really appreciated about Aretha was that she wanted to talk about like my mind for business, which was so helpful. Like our very first conversation, she was like, like, how do you feel about your record deal? Like, do you want to do all your records with this company? Like, have you thought about these other options? Like, um, do you have a manager? Like, it was all very like, have you thought about these career things? Um, and then also at the same time, it was like, what are you practicing? Cause like, here's what I'm practicing on piano. Like, should I be practicing something else? Like what other pianists do you listen to? So the fact that she was always um, searching for information to help herself grow as an artist, even though she was like Aretha Franklin. And, and the fact that um, there were no, there was no hiding of the brushstrokes in terms of like how you should be thinking about the business side of the industry it has always been helpful for me where like anytime anybody reaches out to me, like, I'm super transparent about everything because, you know, I also came into this industry uh, as a film composer, kind of like in a um, side track way or like a side door kind of way in terms of um, uh, the usual process is like you assist somebody or like you come up with a director and I didn't really have those types of, uh, I didn't have that type of entry. And so a lot of this stuff I've learned about the industry, I've learned from mentors or people that were transparent enough to like, tell me like oh you should actually be paying be uh, getting paid x for this project or like you know this is how the budget would work for this and so i feel very similarly where like uh, i try to be as open as possible like as accessible as i possibly can and like uh, there's it's very rare that i don't I can't, I can't even think of a question that somebody's asked me that i didn't feel like i could answer in some sort of way and be as like honest and helpful as possible so i definitely think mm -hmm. having people like Aretha or any other mentor that um, gave me so much information uh, so openly uh, that was so helpful to me and, and want to do that same thing. Um, and also just, again, trying to absorb as much as I can from anybody because I feel like you can always learn, you know, uh, from somebody's playlist or something like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's really interesting because I don't think I, I would have never called it confidence. I would say it was like ignorance, really. Um, I remember doing um, the Sundance Composers Lab and I'll never forget like driving from the airport to Skywalker Ranch and like being with five other young composers that were talking about, you know, who they're working for, who they had worked for or what they learned at school about film scoring or like what they think about so-and-so's compositions and all that stuff. And I remember being in the back of that shuttle and being like, oh man, like I like I actually don't know what I'm doing. Like maybe I shouldn't be here and feeling a lot of imposter syndrome about, um, you know, my ability to, to write for, uh, for film and like my ability to write for the orchestra, like all that kind of stuff. Um, and also when I, I was asked to write a violin concerto, I feel like that was another moment where I felt a lot of questions, but again, in ignorance, they asked me if I would write a violin concerto. And I said, yes, even though I didn't know how to do it. So there's like, you know, what could be seen as confidence was really me being like, I don't know how to do it, but I, I'll figure it out. And I know that like, if I spend enough time doing something, I can like figure out how to do it, uh, at least to the best of my ability. But I feel like um, uh, 
the daily process is always trying to figure out the voice inside that's telling me that I don't belong or shouldn't be here. Like, you know, uh, and so that imposter syndrome, I think really sprung up in the last like eight years or so. And, and Mm -hmm. it's kind of a, kind of a daily, a daily thing for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even bringing that up, I watched, um, the film that you did with the New York times. Oh, thank thank you. Yeah. One of the quotes that I really liked that he said was, um, people always try to do things to stop you in life. You have to say like, no, that will not stop me. Yeah. Would you say that that advice almost played into those, you know, what you were saying, those eight years of figuring it out and, and just kind of jumping into things? Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, that film, you know, it was such an organic thing because my co-director Ben um, really was just like, talk about whatever you, whatever's on your heart right now. And what was on my mind and heart was this imposter syndrome I was dealing with. And in my mind, I was like, okay, my grandfather was 17 when he moved here from the South, didn't even finish high school. And he had a business a couple of years later, like he must have dealt with moments of feeling like I don't belong here or what am I doing? And I kept asking him questions to try to get him to acknowledge that feeling and at some point he was like, why would I doubt myself? Like he was getting upset with me. He was like, why would I generate those thoughts in my own head? Like there's already doubt out here that I'm dealing with. Like why would I double down and do that internally? And that was really helpful uh, in a couple of ways. One, just because it reminded me as much as it feels like our thoughts or my thoughts are um, involuntary or like uncontrollable, that they are things that are happening within my own mind and I can like choose to listen to certain things and choose not to or, you know, acknowledge it and interact with it how I want. But also, I also feel like for him, it was like he was just trying to survive and like he um, didn't have the luxury of time to think about whether or not he belonged somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I think that it was just about getting the work done, trying to do the best job you can, trying to take care of your family. And I feel like that mentality is always helpful where it's like a lot of the imposter syndrome for me is like thinking about these lofty ideas of like what I'm trying to achieve and Oftentimes it's just like, man, let me just try to get the job done, try to do a good job, like put my head down. And I think that mentality is really helpful to not get into any sort of inner dialogue that can stir that up. Has that helped? Speaking of your grandfather, like focusing on his family, has that helped more so now that you're married and, you know, have a baby as well? Yeah, totally. Because it just it feels like a different kind of thing. Like, you know, before my achievement or ambition was based on like, you know, uh, these, this type of recognition or that kind of stuff. And I feel like, you know, now it's so much more driven by like, you know, wanting to make my daughter proud, like in the future, you know, when she looks back at my career to have some sort of sense of pride in who her dad is or like how, how her dad decided to work or, you know, same with my wife and like, and also just making sure that they feel taken care of. Um, but also the fact that I, I identified so much of my self with my career, my craft, and now being a a husband and a father, I feel like so much of my identity is much more about that as well. And so that's definitely just kind of helped me put into perspective, like when a piece of music's not working, that it's not like, you know, me uh, failing at my like, you know, calling in life. It's just like, oh, that music's not working. Let me like go on a walk essentially. So yeah, it's helpful in that way. Yeah, a lot of it's just them uh, believing in me. You know, I think that's what's so wild about my career. Like I think about how hard it is to get into this industry in the first place. And then on top of that, as like um, a black composer, I feel like, you know, before those people gave me opportunities, I always had these roadblocks of like um, typecasting, like even before I did something that like, you know, if I wanted to do a certain kind of film, uh, it was hard to get considered for it, but I'd be considered easily for like, you know, something that needed like a hip hop score, even though I didn't really write that much um, hip hop music. So I feel like it's interesting that it was uh, easy for me to maybe get into the industry if I like bought into that type of um, role or, or, you know, filled that that spot for certain people. And I feel like uh, having people like Justin, uh, who is in a lot of ways one of the first, but Justin and Ava, um, or Blitz or my friend Ray, like these, these filmmakers that are giving me different projects. Uh, a lot of that's just their trust and belief in me and, and feeling good about our collaboration and continuing to work with me. And I li- literally was saying the other day that, um, Ava has hired me now for like four different projects. And each of those projects is vastly different. 
in terms of what it needs musically. And there was never a question as she called me for each of those projects of like, oh, can you do this kind of thing though? Because I know it's different than our last. It was just like, Chris, you know, like we have this next project, can you do it? And and I feel like that type of trust and belief um, is really what uh, has helped me kind of build my career. So yeah, I definitely feel like I've been intentional with who I choose to work with. But that being said, you know, a lot of that wasn't up to me. And so I feel really thankful for all of the artists that, that uh, have chosen to come to me. Yeah. Yeah. It still always gets there. I think that it starts a little differently. Like um, I'll build a palette first with like, what should this score sound like instrumentation wise? Like, is this going to be a lot of synths? Is this going to be a lot of like strings or a lot of piano or whatever it is? So I feel like a lot of that conversation with the director in the beginning helps us find a, uh, a palette to work from. So that way, when I'm trying to focus on the idea of like nostalgia, I at least have a set of aural colors to work with that I can pull from. Um, so yeah, I think once I have that palette established, then each of those projects or each genre of, of project, uh, the process for me is still the same. It's still like very emotionally driven for sure. Mm -hmm. And is there a project, like a past project that you wish that people would uh, revisit more often that you feel doesn't get, you know, the love it deserves? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I feel like, um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like it got a lot of love, but my, my, my um, work on Kobe's documentary and like that documentary in particular, I feel like, you know, we're in this, this season right now of a lot of, athletes making documentaries about themselves and you know the last dance or like the david beckham thing that just came out and i feel like the kobe one when we were making that was like before a lot of those things had happened and i think in a lot of ways like um set the bar for what a sports documentary could could be and feel like um and so much of my mentality i mean i spent a lot of time with him after that film but i feel like a lot of my mentality is inspired uh, by him and also like my mentality when it comes to composing was directly inspired by him and, and that project so I feel like that one maybe comes to mind oh, that's yeah. cool. I, I need to see that yeah it's really and, good you know you've also gone into filmmaking especially you have the last repair shop that just recently came out and what made you want to step into onto that side of of the business going from composing to to now filmmaking and directing yeah, a lot of it actually was that documentary for Kobe uh, because when I was working on it, my friend called me in to possibly score it. And he was like, look, we have a final cut essentially that we're going to share with Kobe. And like once he gives it the thumbs up, you can start scoring it and we're just going to like lock picture and all of that. And they showed it to Kobe and he was like, absolutely not. Like we have to start all over. And so they started from scratch remaking the movie and... I stayed on the team the whole time while they were making it and Kobe was very familiar with that process. And so like, you know, there was a house down in Irvine that we all went to and like, I go down there uh, every week or a couple times a week. And like, they'd be basically teaching Kobe about filmmaking and about storytelling and about myth and all this stuff. And uh, that's like where his fascination started with storytelling. And for me, I was like, wow, like I never thought about how each of these stories is like helping us explore this like psychological part of ourselves and like, all of those things I think, I think I was like so enamored with. Um, and I also, uh, again, like being a musician primarily from this place of story or emotion or narrative, I feel like I always wanted to express things in um, terms of like a story. And so it kind of started with that that interest. And then I met my co-director on, on Repair Shop, Ben Proudfoot, when I was, um, I wrote, a short film that I wanted to get made and, and he uh, helped produce it and like lent me some equipment and um, I went and directed it and it just is like a, a self-funded student film that I don't think we'll ever see the live day, but, <laughs> but that process um, really bonded us. And so, you know, us making these films together, Concerto and now The Last Repair Shop um, has really been also like a way for me to continue to grow in that and like watch him and he's, made so many short documentaries that I, it's also been a process for me to like uh, kind of have a way to like practice and, and you know, learn uh, and, and definitely want to continue to do that.